Thank you for the introduction, and I regret that I can't be uh, there in Omaha in person to provide you with this discussion. Uh, history is a interesting thing, and I'm going to try to take you back to, in some cases, to your childhood, and in some cases to your pre-womb uh, experience. And uh, the work that uh, we're going to be covering starts in the, really in the 50s, and kind of peaks out in the 60s, and uh, of course has continued on up until now. But we want to try to talk about receptors, receptors particularly for the estrogens, receptors for steroid hormones in, in general, probably will come up, come to play in this talk. But to try to take you back to the time where this started, we would have you go through a little bit through this slide. Back, if you go back into the 1930s, this in terms of the steroid hormones was the era when we started just isolating the chemical structure. So this was an era of the chemists. Starting in the 30s, at the same time what was going on in biochemistry in general, and one could say in biology in general, was the understanding that biology, biological functions were due in particular to enzymatic machinery, and these enzymes were protein in their chemical structure. And what happened then was that in this era, we under, started understanding glycolytic pathways, oxidative pathways, and so forth. And then we started realizing that some uh, minor factors, the vitamins, particularly, for instance, here, riboflavin, but these are, were important components of these biological systems in that they were actually part and uh, acted as cofactors with certain uh, other proteins and particularly a lot of enzymes. So these uh, uh, systems were being worked out then in the late 30s. Now, also then by this time in the late 30s, we started realizing that some of the hormones were actually uh, the metabolic products, and in some cases, metabolic products of other hormones. So that testosterone was uh, found to be converted to estrogenic hormones, but just in a very general way. Now then, when we got into the 40s, of course, that was the time of the Second World War, and uh, some research was certainly slowed down during that period. But again, these various cofactors, coenzymes, these were kind of pretty much completely elucidated, and uh, people started developing sort of broader theories on this, and David Green, who was uh, actually on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, made this statement about uh, any of these uh, trace element types of products like hormones and vitamins, that they would function through their participa participation in uh, enzyme systems. Now, again, over here we started seeing some uh, evidence that when you injected uh, steroid hormones or looked at steroid hormone effects, that you could see changes in uh, enzymatic activity. But it wasn't clear how the steroid was exactly doing this. But it was just that there was a change in enzymatic activity following the, the administration of the steroid hormone. So then we move up into the 1950s. And uh, the 50s then were a time of great revolution in biology. And uh, we've kind of finished working out some of the uh, mechanisms of uh, enzymatic function of metabolism, and so oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport uh, were worked out. The machinery for protein synthesis was starting to be worked out. And we started by the use of electron microscopy to see structures that have particular functions in these cells. And this, the climax of this uh, sort of sequence of events in the 50s then was uh, the development of the double, or the development of the ideas of the double helix of DNA. 
So that pretty much the structure of machinery for how living systems worked had been worked out by this time in the 50s. Now in the case of the steroid hormones, we now were, had available uh, some radioactively labeled uh, compounds and it was shown for sure that uh, uh, the pathway then led from uh, testosterone to estradiol and that uh, one could look then at the estradiol going into tissues, plasma, and, and coming through in the urine and feces, and a large number of studies were being done on this. <coughs> now remember that the C14 labeled compounds in general are much, very low in specific activity. And so these studies, while uh, useful in some ways, uh, we're not really leading to an understanding of how the steroid hormones function. So starting in the 50s, particularly with bacterial systems, the steps from DNA gene expression through the intermediate of the RNA messengers and then to the production of specific proteins was worked out. And uh, things like the operon theory in bacterial systems uh, Allosteric proteins coming out in, uh, in a beautiful work uh, from Chabot's lab. Uh, not, pardon me, Chabot's. Oh, uh, can we stop this uh, thing too? Like, what's his name? Oh. Two, two Nobel Prizes, right? <laughs> huh? No, it wasn't Chabot. It was. Uh, um. I should do, shouldn't even worry about it because I'm just giving the details I don't need. So I'll, let me I'll start up and I'll just be starting and it's the same allosteric proteins were developed. And then it was found that in uh, animal cells that we had what appeared to be the precursors for messenger RNAs, but it was referred to as HN or heterogeneous RNA because of the wide variety of sizes and so forth. And at the time that was about all we could uh, do in terms of experimental work. And then finally in 1965, a specific messenger RNA for hemoglobin was isolated and identified. Now what was going on with receptors? In the late 50s, estrogen binding was shown to occur in the uterus and other target tissues. And so this was a very major uh, development and we'll spend some time talking about that. And then in 1964, the nuclear localization of the bound estrogen was worked out. And then uh, in 1966, there was the isolation of a specific uh, cytosolic uh, protein that appeared to be the estrogen receptor, and the development then of a model in which estrogen plus the receptor formed a complex and ended up being uh, found in the nuclear compartment of target cells. And then in terms of tissue response, again, a lot, a lot of developments. Estrogen effects were shown in general on RNA and protein synthesis. And then it was shown that the effects of estrogen on a variety of things could be blocked if you block protein synthesis through the use of pharmacological agents, in this case pyromycin. And then similar studies were done with an RNA synthesis uh, inhibitor, actinomycin D. So the dependence on protein synthesis and, and RNA synthesis were shown and again in this time frame. And the, then studies were showed that estrogen actually stimulated RNA polymerase activity. And then this induction of specific uh, proteins was shown again by the middle of the 60s. So in this period from the late 50s through the middle of the 60s, an awful lot of developments which laid the groundwork for new ideas in this field occurred. So this is sort of a synopsis of the, of the work I'd like to just follow up with. Now, in this next slide, we'll show a, shows a model of a system which is rather of interest historically, although of probably of no practical interest. And that is in the 50s, if you have uh, been interested in hormone action and that's the time when I got introduced into this field. 
everyone knew how the steroid hormones worked, and this involved in both estrogens and the other steroid hormones, such as uh, androgens, glucocorticoids. And that was a theory that had been developed by a number of investigators, which involved the concept that many of the steroid hormones had a uh, reducible hydroxyl group in, a, in some position on the molecule. In the case of estradiol, the, sort of the major estrogenic compound, this is at the 17 position. And this uh, hydroxyl could be then uh, oxidized to estrone, which is another estrogen. And the idea then was that in this system, one would transfer uh, hydrogens and electrons to NADP to give you NAD, the reduced form of NADPH, getting estrone, and this in turn then could re be, in a sense, recycled back to the estradiol through the reduction from NADH. Now this, as you remember from your biochemistry, is uh, a system found in, in the energy producing parts of cells. And NADPH is often thought to be associated with growth responses and is uh, used as a, as a source of electrons and uh, reducing equivalents uh, in growth processes. So what we had was a system then of transferring, <coughs> pardon me, reducing equivalents from this one system to this other system with the key intermediate being this transhydrogenase, with the cofactor being the uh, estrogen molecule in this particular case. Now this really fit into what everybody was thinking. If you go back in time and think of the fact that everyone was concerned with met intermediate metabolism, here was a very interesting system. Now, a few people raised questions about this, and actually if one studies this uh, total picture of the data in this system, you realize that it's impossible to really explain all of the steroid hormone action. But it wasn't until a, an organic chemist at the University of Chicago, Elwood Jensen, came along that uh, this theory was disproved. And uh, Elwood Jensen's, oops, Elwood Jensen was an organic chemistry then at the University of Chicago, but he was working in a laboratory of Charles Huggins, who was a Nobel Prize winner, for the uh, uh, work that had been done on estrogen effects on breast cancer. And in this setting, Jensen brought in some uh, interesting ideas to this system, but he mostly brought in the ability to do certain kinds of experiments. And that is previous uh, work that had been done with radioactive hormones, injecting them into animals, had used C14 level compounds, which have low specific activity. Jensen had the ability, plus he had the access to the Argonne laboratories near the Chicago, where he could make tritiated uh, labeled compounds by uh, gas exchange procedures. And he was able to make that a high specific activity estradiol, <coughs> which had uh, hundreds of times more uh, higher specific activity than previously used C14 labeled estrogens. So that was one thing. Plus, he also was able to, uh, in an era before the scintillation counters that are currently used or other procedures, he was able to. Uh, make use of procedures for measuring these uh, low specific, uh, I mean these uh, high specific activity estrogens in uh, uh, with uh, procedures and equipment that just was not available to very many people, although shortly thereafter it was. So he did just a very basic simple experiment. He just injected rats with uh, this labeled estrogen, but remember in this case he was injecting 0.01 microgram, whereas most previous experiments had been probably working with 
uh, maybe close to 100 micrograms of C14 act, uh, active compound. And what he found was that when he injected this material, then took out tissues at various times afterward, their tissues fell into two categories. Tissues which uh, normally are thought to be target tissues for estrogens, the uterus, vagina, that the, there was an uptake period and then a retention indicating a slow de uh, decay or a slow loss of the uh, estrogen from the tissue, and the, from these tissues. Whereas other tissues such as the liver, kidney, etc., there was a peak very early and then it declined very rapidly. <coughs> this was the first time anyone had seen any uh, data which suggested there was something unique about target tissues relative to non-target tissues in the way they interacted with a hormone or with any actual uh, uh, tissue regulator. So this uh, graph here is probably one of the most uh, key uh, uh, pictures you'll see and that's from the work that Jensen did with a colleague, in this case Herb Jacobson. And this work was reported in the 50s. And the interesting, one interesting story that comes about this is that remember this was in an era where the transhydrogenases were, were the answer to the hormone problem. And Jensen had this work done and he decided to, to give a report at a meeting similar to the kind of meeting you people are having here today and but in this case, the meeting was an international biochemistry meeting in Europe. And uh, it was at the same meeting, it turned out, and fortuitously, one might say, or maybe not fortuitously, uh, so, uh, by chance, that there was a whole symposium on transhydrogenases and the uh, steroid hormone uh, interactions with the transhydrogenases and their effects on it. And this was a major symposium and uh, probably a thousand people or so were at that meeting. And again, by chance, Jensen's uh, little 10 minute talk was scheduled for the same time. And so Jensen reports that uh, a handful of his friends, I've seen different numbers, but it ranges from six to 10 people were there in the audience to hear his talk. And it's an interesting phenomenon then to think about the fact that a major uh, symposium was occurring. A lot of people went away probably thinking they had heard the gospel and uh, there were 10 people who had heard the data uh, that pretty much uh, destroyed that whole theory uh, rather quickly. And there is a moral to this thing is that people then started <laughs> looking back at the transhydrogenase idea and started seeing it, and now emphasizing all the negative uh, things that have happened. For instance, diethylstilbestrol, which is a very potent estrogen, does not have a hydroxyl group that can be oxidized and reduced by, the same, by any of these kind of enzymes. It requires some different mechanisms because it, it, it's uh, phenolic, they're all phenol phenolics, uh, hydroxyls, and not uh, the aliphatic type of hydroxyl that uh, is present on estradiol. So this uh, work then really changed things. And then another critical thing that Jensen did is he took the extracts of these tissue with this radioactive activity that was present in the target tissue, just ran it out on um, chromatography and just as you can see, only seven different fractions. And either at two hours or six hours, after injecting estradiol, what he found was that 96 to 93 percent of the radioactivity was still in the form of estradiol. A uh, tiny amount would have been converted to estrone. So from this data, he also then destroyed another whole concept that had been present, and that is that metabolism of the hormones was not crucial to their function. And this was a very uh, major finding because at that time, what was the bulk of the work that was being done on the estrogens or any other steroid hormones 
in terms of their interaction with target tissues involved looking for metabolites because of, the, again, this era that we were in where metabolism was so important. And this work then showed that it couldn't. Actually, just this work alone was not sufficient, and Jensen did some other beautiful experiments, some very cute experiments I've always thought, which uh, again eliminated the possibility of there being any metabolism occurring in the estradiol in that target tissue. Well, then in work done in this case, uh, starting off with work done by Bill Notboom. We started looking at the subs, uh, subcellular distribution of this radioactive material, and it was quickly shown then that when you use physiological amounts of the hormone injecting it, that the compound was present in nuclear fractions. This again was a, a revelation in that. Uh, Again, because again of some of the previous work on metabolism and so forth, it was had been probably thought that in many cases these hormones would function perhaps out in the cytoplasmic compartment. Although uh, some people had already suggested that nuclear function was going to be important because of the work on RNA and protein synthesis, but in any case, this did uh, prove that it was a nuclear function. And I should say is that by the early 60s, methodologies were available to measure the steroid uh, uh, tritium labeled compounds, and the tritium labeled compounds had been made available by uh, some of the companies that were uh, producing these materials. So now anybody could work with this. Jensen's work was not exclusive anymore. So this was then the nuclear function. The next slide just shows uh, an immuno. Uh, are using immunological techniques uh, with an antibody to the estrogen receptor that again in this case uh, these are uh, early embryos that the receptor is localized in the nucleus of these cells and this was in the nucleus whether there was estrogen or whether the embryos had been exposed to estrogen or not and in the case of uh, the use of a of a uh, compound which would interact with, the, with this antibody rather specifically, you can see how you decrease the binding of the antibody and in indicating some specificity to this work. Now the next uh, step then was it turned out, although there was present in the nuclear compartment after treatment, if you took a tissue like the uterus and uh, you rounded up, <coughs> extracted with a variety of media, most of the receptor turned out to be ex readily extractable and was present in what is referred to as a cytosol fraction. This does not mean that it was present in the cytoplasm. It just means that it was extractable from wherever it had been in the tissue. And, what, uh, and so people could extract the receptor and a whole variety of techniques were tried to try to work with this compound. Uh, because of the peculiar nature of the receptor, it turned out to be very, very difficult. And, but David Toft, who's uh, now at the Mayo Foundation, but I believe it then was then at the University of Illinois, was able to use sucrose gradients to separate out a fraction which uh, in this case uh, runs, as you can see here, as a very large protein or a protein aggregate. And so here you would get this peak, which was the uh, uh, estro labeled estrogen bound to this protein fraction. And with some binding then to uh, an area where there was the bulk of the protein. And here you can see the optical density then as an indicator this was where the bulk of the protein was present. If you put in an unlabeled estrogen, in this case diethylstilbestrol, but also would be with estradiol, you would block the binding to this uh, very heavy fraction and the only binding that occurred back here in this uh, other uh, fraction. Now, 
with this uh, ability to look at the receptor then in the uh, cytosol and uh, but finding most of it present in the nucleus, there was another whole area of work that uh, was going on and that was the response to the hormone. Now we said that there had been shown by the use of inhibitors like puramycin and actinomycin D that there was a dependency on RNA and protein synthesis for the biological responses of the tissue. And so there was an emphasis then on trying to find some more direct evidence for gene expression being involved. And a variety of different uh, approaches were used. It was, it was able to show that there were effects of estrogen on, in general on RNA synthesis, on protein synthesis. This tissue is growing in response to estrogen. These are not surprising. But uh, we did not see anything rather specific. But Angela Notides, again at the University of Illinois, did show in a, some very beautiful experiments that there was a specific, at least one specific protein that was being turned on early. So in 1965, again back in the uh, dark ages of, of the technology, he used early gel electrophoresis. And he would take tissue extracts from control and estrogen treated uh, target tissues, incubate uh, one, uh, uh, say the control tissue with one isotope, uh, a C14 a labeled isotope, and then the, on the other side he would then use a tritium labeled uh, compound in, uh, uh, with uh, with the estrogen treated. In this case, he was using diethylstilbestrol with uh, tritium labeled proteins, and he used diethylstilbestrol to stimulate the tissue, and then incubated with a tritium labeled amino acid precursor. And then in the control over here, uh, in this case, he's, uh, I, I should uh, explain that. The double labeling experiments were used in some situations. In this particular case, he used a control uh, system in which two, we had two gels. So we had tritium labeled amino acids in both cases. In this case, in some cases, we would use a C14 labeling uh, to do these experiments for one of these situations. Then you would run the gels try to run them in parallel as best you can. If you can use the two different uh, isotopes, you can run them in one gel. And what we found was that there was this protein that it managed to move off into an area where, away from the bulk of the proteins. And it was markedly stimulated within an hour of diethylstilbestrol treatment or it could be estradiol treatment. And this protein then was referred to as IP protein. And uh, Later, it was shown to be a, a protein of, of, uh, in, of some importance in intermediate metabolism, but it's never been shown to have any uh, major regulatory function. But it was interesting that it did prove that there was a specific protein that could be induced by a hormone. And uh, then this led to many other people doing other uh, systems some of which were more readily uh, uh, worked with in this uh, uterine tissue that, that we were working with in, in this, these particular experiments. So this all led then to uh, a model in which the receptor is still the critical factor with estrogen being able to move into the target tissues finds these proteins which have a high affinity to estrogen, and I haven't dwelled, dwelled on, I should say, on that, but the affinity of the estrogen for the receptor is extremely high, and this was a crucial factor. And this was worked out in these early studies back in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, as a result of this interaction, there is some modification in the receptor, and uh, in turn, then this receptor then has an effect on gene expression, and then we can get these new 
protein. So this was sort of a state of things in the 60s. We now have a obviously much uh, more interesting models, one would say, in that, uh, and more complex models, in which there are interactions between this uh, receptor here and with other uh, systems of regulation that even occur at the cell surface. So it's a much more complicated picture. In a way, it was more fun back when we had these simple models. We didn't have to worry about all those complexities that you people who are working in these fields have to be concerned with in the present. But this sort of general model uh, held in, in the 60s, and uh, the outline of it is probably not too different than what is present now, except with these additional complexities. We thought at that time, and we are we uh, at that time that there may have been some kind of a translocation process of receptor into the nucleus uh, being regulated by the steroid. Uh, I think that has been disproved. Uh, at least in the case of the estrogen receptor, that it appears to be localized in the nucleus prior to the interaction with the steroid hormone. And uh, so there, but there may be some differences between different steroid hormones in terms of this initial localization of the receptor. There's so many really interesting questions and start coming up as one starts dealing with this model. For one thing is, why is this uh, nuclear receptor, as shown by the uh, uh, immunological studies and other procedures, why is it so readily extractable? What is it interacting with under this set of circumstances versus once it's uh, been interacting with a steroid hormone, why now does it have such a high affinity for, for the, the uh, nuclear, some nuclear components? So I'd like to then just end with, again, some or more of these questions that have kind of come up and some, some things that uh, you may want to be thinking about. One, again, one of the major factors is the number of receptors that are present in a cell. And in a number of cell systems, this seems to be in this, nature, uh, in this range of 20 to 50,000 per cell. That means it's uh, not a protein of, in present mass amounts. On the other hand, that's an awful lot of receptors present if you think about stimulating one specific uh, gene. We don't think that it does disp uh, regulate one specific gene in most instances because in general it turns on growth and other things, but still it seems uh, like a surprisingly high number for even uh, to regulate, say, a, a couple of hundred genes seems like an awful lot of receptors. And almost all of those which are interacted with estrogen once, or once they have interacted with estrogen are bound in some tight form to some materials present in the, the nucleus. And one other factor that's of some interest, and this is from one system, and that is uh, pituitary cells which respond to estrogen in two ways. And one of these is that they respond in the production of prolactin. And another way they respond is in, is in growth. There are some other systems that are rather similar to this, but this is a model that was used in our laboratory. But that is if you have a fairly high concentration of estrogen, you can occupy most of these, bind, uh, these binding sites. And under those conditions, you'll get uh, maximum growth and maximum prolactin synthesis. But you, if you start going down in the concentration of the hormone, you'll get a lower occupancy rate. And so at this 10 to the minus 11th molar, you have about half saturation of these receptor sites. And if you move on down to 10 to the minus 14th, which is a pretty low amount of estrogen, you're only going to get maybe 30 30 or less, let's just say less than 100 of these sites occupied. Now under those conditions, here you get essentially little or no effect of the estrogen on prolactin synthesis. If you get up here to 10 to the minus 12 where you get 3,000 or roughly 10% of the cells occupied, you'll start getting 
roughly 10% of the maximum prolactin synthesis effects. But what's surprising is to look here at the growth response, and that is even when you're only at half set maximal saturation, you get about a 100% change in growth. You can get all the way down here to this very small number of occupied receptor sites, and you're getting half maximal effects on growth. And this has been seen in at least two systems. Uh, in this system, and then in, uh, uh, in mammary uh, cells, which are which have been in culture for some period of time, but seem to respond in similar ways, although they don't have a simple marker like this. But in terms of their growth response, they respond to extremely low levels of the hormone. So again, these are questions. Maybe we don't need all of these receptors for some effects, and maybe we do for others. Or are there different pools of receptors that are being involved? And in any case, there are questions like this and many others. And that uh, we're leaving it to this next generation of people working on this to solve these problems. Now, if there is a question or two from uh, another colleague, Dr. Fern Murdoch, who's in the pathology department here at the University of Wisconsin, has kindly uh, agreed to sit through this talk and uh, maybe raise a question or two. And I'm going to sit down. So the time of the 60s and the 70s is where you really emphasize how much new data was being collected and new ideas being put forth for how estrogens worked. What do you think were really the, the key concepts that got introduced during that time? I think, uh, again, uh, work always seems to move in waves. And the waves are dictated somewhat by concepts, but actually mostly by, by methodology. And in, in that period, we started finally learning how to work with the nucleic acids. I think that was a major finding. But also working more with proteins. And the ability to start separating proteins, even in the crude of gel electrophoresis that I showed at least one slide of. And uh, starting to look at uh, R, uh, RNAs. We started, uh, or people in the field started looking at at least ribosomal RNA as distinguished from this so called heterogeneous, <coughs> pardon me, heterogeneous RNA. And so this technology started permitting this real ability to start looking at. This, uh, these ideas of gene expression, which were, had been developed a lot in bacterial systems with, where they could manipulate the systems in a lot different way and it didn't really require all of the biochemistry. But the biochemistry came after we developed a methodology to start looking at this. And that was a very, very important aspect of this. And it changed the direction because all of a sudden you didn't have to do intermediary metabolism. Because up to that point, that's about all you could do, is look at the metabolism. And you also emphasize the importance of having those radio label ligands so you could follow the protein. Right, that was also, I should, that would be also an extremely important aspect of it, particularly the tritium label. In the case of the steroid hormone receptors, you just could not have done anything without You know, the, the whole concept of a receptor protein um, or a receptor substance of some kind had been around since the turn of the century for neurotransmitters. But they're the really... The turn of the... 19th century. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, but there really hadn't been a demonstration of a physical entity until, I believe, uh, with the estrogen receptor by you and Todd, the isolation of a fraction that you would characterize on those sucrose gradients. But even up to that point, there was resistance to the idea of a receptor. Right. Uh, the, uh, the initial work came from the pharmacologist who, who needed to have a, a, at least a theoretical entity that would explain how different drugs interacted with, with tissues and with organisms. And so that, as you said, came out extremely early. But people were unable to ever identify these compounds, and so there was 
and so there were some skeptics. Actually, and I remember in the case of the uh, steroid receptors, even actually the interaction with purity nucleotides of a steroid, where it was thought, at least by one very prominent uh, biochemical endocrinologist at Harvard, was, was pushing that idea. So the idea of what a receptor might be was really quite big. And uh, it was of interest that in the, some of the early meetings that I went to where there were uh, neural uh, biologists who were interested in neural receptors that the model system that was used at that time were systems like, such as acetylcholinesterase, which is really a an enzyme involved in the metabolism of, of, of a neurotransmitter. But uh, certainly would, would, would be pushing it in terms of thinking of that being a receptor, but those interactions were were being studied as a model system for for receptors. So it was really the steroid receptors were the first ones really to be identified in, in any kind of a biochemical uh, way. Although remember these were pretty crude measures. Those sucrose gradients were, they were pretty pretty crude, but they were the receptor was at least isolated and certain things with it, uh, uh, separated it at least from the bulk of the protein. I, I, I think during this time, the protein chemistry actually gave us a lot of information about the steroid receptors and what they could could do, and maybe you could comment on, on some of the protein biochemistry that was done that um, gave us the functions. Well, you might define that a little more, what were you thinking? Other things, not only ligand binding, but DNA binding and all specific yeah. domains. I think all yeah. of that was elucidated by the protein chemistry, wasn't it? Yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of the things that uh, we now know about uh, from uh, work having been done with uh, sequence analysis, particularly of the DNAs, really had its roots back in, the, in these initial protein chemistry, to where we. We knew that the steroid receptors were going to be related to each other just from the nature of the kind of compounds they, they found. And um, many of their, uh, their characteristics in terms of separations and um, techniques that were available at the time. And later with um, uh, the development of DNA analysis, much of this was, was confirmed. But I would say, to me, at least the bulk of the ideas that the receptors were compounds, which certainly had at least some parts of them that were quite hydrophobic, uh, that those have turned out to be true, that uh, they are proteins that interact with other proteins to a great extent, and uh, that they're even in their own right, they are fairly complex and have domain structure. And we knew already that there had to be something that would explain uh, the DNA binding, the, the uh, steroid binding, and possibly others. It's kind of interesting that there was some evidence already that there was some kind of allosteric type of protein that we were dealing with because we could uh, show that there, there was an influence from one binding site to another binding site, DNA, DNA binding. steroid binding, but also the reverse of that, that the DNA binding would have an influence on the steroid binding. And the other topic I'd like to raise is when you look back at the literature in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and certainly some of your own work, there's a lot of discussion of chromatin, really the understanding that these receptors were important for regulating gene expression. But that work was limited in how far it could go. Yeah, the chromatin idea actually goes, uh, I don't know, actually the earliest reference, but one of the earliest references was, was in the work of Dr. Gerald Mueller, University of Wisconsin. He had a model that he presented in 1957 at the Laurentian Hormone Conference. And in that model, he indicated the estrogen 
we're interacting with something which in turn we're interacting with the uh, chromat uh, of target tissues. And it's a rather, you know, from our current perspective, would be a kind of a crude model, but really it contained the essence of probably where we are at the present time, where it's still a very difficult area to work in. But uh, we didn't have the tools at that time to work on specific kind of interactions of, of, of the chromatin proteins with the DNA. We didn't have chip assays and things of that kind, which might start at least narrowing this down. Uh, for instance, in our lab, and this was then in, in the 60s, there's a, a whole PhD thesis on, on estrogen effects on chromatin on the histone proteins, but it's never been published. It's, it's very difficult to come up with real conclusions from with the limited kind of uh, methodology that we had available. So I guess that comes full circle to what you said uh, in answer to my first question, which is that these waves of, of understanding are driven very much by what we have available technically to us. Yeah, that's a big thing. I think one of the big things I hope everyone may take away from this meeting is the fact that you have to be careful uh, what uh, what influences there are from the from your environment. And uh, science is not democratic. You don't vote it in theories and stuff. And so Jensen's uh, <coughs> initial work with the receptors wasn't maybe the most popular thing in the world at the time. I'm sure that there were a lot of people who were, who were very unhappy with him. But uh, that was that. That's what has prevailed, and that's what you have to always be thinking about science. So you want to always be very suspicious, be very skeptical. Is my feeling about about current trends because you know, often they are they lead you into believing stuff that uh, is, is not necessarily true. And I'll thank you, and I think this is a good time to conclude.